Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got Kevin Wilkie, the Marketing Development Director with Kuyu. Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing well today, sir. How are you? Good. I'm looking forward to doing this podcast. Uh, I want to introduce you. Um, I call you the archery guru, uh, but for you know that term gets thrown around a lot, and <laughs> quite honestly, you probably wouldn't like me calling you that, but um, truly, you're uh, an incredible archer. I've got some some things that you've accomplished: World Games gold uh, gold medalist, World Field silver medalist, Vegas 900 Club, uh, NFAA Field Hunter Round record holder, 560 out of 560, uh, 20 plus national and international pro level podium finishes. Uh, yeah, I would say archery guru is a pretty good title. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been my life. Um, as long as I can remember, we had, we had bows around the house as a kid. And, um, yeah, it's, it's something that when I was a kid in school, like uh, going into a parent teacher conference and they're like, this kid's a little too much in archery. You might want to get him into something else that he can make a career out of. And, uh, anyway, no, it, it's the archery thing's done well for me. That's fantastic. Um, today we're going to uh, answer a bunch of questions from Instagram followers and podcast listeners on archery. And we, I kind of open it up to any archery questions. I think as we move along, we're going to try and do some more of these this spring and this summer and into the fall, into the hunting season. So I want listeners to kind of get uh, comfortable with Kevin and, and his ability to answer questions and bring the knowledge that he has um, before we do that, Kevin, being that market, marketing director with Kuyu, on an everyday level or, or everyday case, what what is it that you do with Kuyu? Yeah, my day-to-day, um, I, I work from home. I live in Santa Quin, Utah. I've got uh, my home office set up. It's actually my, my shop in my backyard. I have all my archery gear here. Like I have pretty much every tool under the sun used to work on bows all my reloading equipment, also my home office, all in one little shop. Um, So I work remotely. I spend maybe um, every six weeks or so at the Kuyu office, um, just touching base with the team there. But So my day-to-day, I I write uh, our product description. So when we have a new product coming down the hatch, uh, I work with our development team to get all the ins and outs of it and – And I basically translate that in a way that most hunters or hopefully all hunters will be able to understand what that product is used for. It's best case scenario when you would use it. Um, So when you read a description on, on Kuyu.com, I'm likely the guy that put it together. Some of the older products I I haven't had a hand in, but a lot of the newer products that we've come out with, I've played a part in, in writing those descriptions. So try to write everything from a hunter stand or point of view and, uh, another thing that I'm in charge of is our is our blog content. So if you if you go to kuyu.com and look on Basecamp, I'm the guy that kind of funnels everything into that. So uh, I write a lot of the articles myself. Um, I know Jay, we've had you help us with quite a few of them, and and a lot of the other guys within Kuyu that um, that are big time hunters. I, that's who we're getting our content from. Um, yeah. From your point of view, Kevin, how important is it, and I think that's one of the things that Kuyu has done such a great job at, is having hunters, you know, involved in the company and having hunters and have it, I I like hearing it when you say come from a hunter's point of view so that when hunters read it, they understand it and you're speaking the language, but how important do you think that is from a consumer standpoint, um, being able to, you know, digest the information about all of the different products that Kuyu comes out with coming from hunters language and, you know, speaking directly to the hunters. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been in your shoes. Like we're, we're hunters just like you guys are. And and that's, that's where we do our real world product testing is on the mountain. And I mean, you wouldn't want it coming from anybody else really. Like I, I, and it's easy to see right through it. You can you can tell. Like I've looked back at other products and the way they're marketed. If it's a somebody that doesn't hunt that's putting it together, like we're good hunters, we can see through that kind of stuff. So it's so vital for our business to not only just so we appear authentic, but just so we get it right. Um, you know, it's a hunter that's designing these products. It's a hunter that's 
marketing them. Um, not everybody that works at Kuyu hunts, and I, and I don't think that's really important, but, you know, the, the people that are driving the direction forward, we all, we're all big hunters. Speaking of hunters, um, you're quite the hunter yourself. What is, what would you say is your number one animal that you like to hunt? I am a mule deer guy. Like that's from just as a kid, I just, I've always been fascinated by mule deer living in Utah. You know, the elk hunting wasn't that great here when I was a kid. Like I remember being in school and some kids had never even seen an elk before. And, but it, it just really elk numbers have really exploded, but I love hunting elk, but mule deer is where my heart lies. Both archery and rifle. You know, I, I've taken two deer with a rifle, two mule deer with my rifle. And I, I didn't hunt with a rifle until I was like in my late twenties, but as a kid, I, I only bow hunted. So from the time I was 14 till, um, I, I think I shot my, my first deer with a rifle when I was in my mid twenties. But would you say rifle hunting has kind of captivated you? I mean, as, as much as we're going to get into archery here and as much of a, you know, guru as you are with archery, long range shooting and, and, you know, hunting, so to speak with a rifle has has really got your, uh, wheels turning right now too, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. So my, my previous job, I worked for uh, gold tip bee stinger archery and, and part of their company was Vista outdoor and they, uh, working under Vista, you know, they own federal ammunition, Savage arms, um, RCBS reloading. And, and I grew up doing all that. Like my brother was a big reloader and, um, we would rifle hunt every year. It's just in Utah, you had to pick your weapon and I always chose to hunt with a bow, but you know, coming from a competitive background in archery, the PRS shooting sports has really caught my attention. Just something else to do. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm a shooter. I love to shoot. So the accuracy, the, the competition is what drives me. So that's kind of what's got me back into rifles in the last few years. And I have five kids, three boys and two girls. So um, getting them out on the bow hunt's a little trickier. It's right as school starts. Um, but rifle season, things have kind of, mellowed out with school and it's, it's easier to take kids rifle hunting. And though I haven't taken a, an animal with a rifle in quite a while, still, even though I'm really into rifles, I still bow hunt. Right um, on. It's, just, it's more fun for my kids. I want to ask you a little bit about your, um, you know, all of the traveling that you did and all of the tournaments that you shot and now having a family, was that one of the leading forces in kind of getting you, if you will, settling down a little bit and not as much out on the pro circuit? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I started competing at an early age. Like I remember going to my first 3d tournament when I was like, well, we, we helped to run the 3d club here in, in Utah and in pace in Utah as Blackhawk archers back in the day. Um, so I, I kind of started out competing in early age. And then as I got into my twenties, I was still competing while I had a family, you know, I, but, uh, you know, I had three kids most of the time while I was accomplishing the most and traveling the world and shooting. It was fun, but man, it, it sucks to be away from family and at home. Um, and leaving all that on my wife to take care of it was, it was pretty taxing to say the least. So, I've trimmed it back. I still compete. Like, um, I shot Vegas this year. I, I shoot mainly two or three national tournaments a year, and I try to shoot everything local that I can. Um, but back in the day, like 2006 through 2013, 2013, I was, man, I was shooting. I wasn't shooting as much as everybody else, but I, I was still going to about a dozen national tournaments a year, eight to 12 big matches a year and it was it's a lot of work oh absolutely absolutely um let's just dive right into the questions here uh we've got a bunch of them so let's let's just get into that and yeah. is that um i hear a phone or something else in the background what is that on your computer oh sorry that was my i'll turn it down it was just a notification that i had a podcast with jay scott and was late <laughs> for. don't be late 
<laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, we've got a question here from Ace Rifles Nevada on Instagram. Uh, benefits, if there are any, of a four-fletched arrow? Yeah, so four-fletch has been around for quite a while. Like It, it comes and goes. Uh, the benefits of it would be being able to shoot a lower profile, shorter fletching to get better clearance. So when I, when I say clearance, it means like around your arrow rest or even shooting through grass or brush, it's going to be a little bit tighter profile. However, it would have the same stability as a larger three fletch arrow setup. So um, going to four fletch gives you the option to kind of scale things down to where they're a little more aerodynamic a little bit better in a crosswind. Um, and also, for tuning purposes, it gives you um, one extra position that you can clock your arrow to find like the perfect sweet spot. Uh, whereas with a three-fletch arrow, you can only clock it in three different positions. Four-fletch, you can clock it in four positions. So if you're a guy that's taking a next level tuning your arrows, um, four-fletch, it, it definitely has its, uh, its place. Would you recommend, and do you shoot four fletched arrows? It depends on the year. Like I, I kind of, I bounce back and forth. Um, I can't tell you I'm going to go out and shoot a lot better scores with four fletch over three fletch, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you that the only reason I killed this deer or whatever is because I was shooting four fletch. The gains are so minimal between the two that you have to be like top of your game to even be able to tell a difference. Okay, so it's not like someone that just shoots every once in a while. If they shoot the four fletch, all of a sudden it's going to up their game that much. It's more for the guy that shoots all the time that's really refining, and he might see a difference uh, from time to time. Exactly, yep. But, uh, you know, if, if now let's say you're, you do not have enough fletching on your arrow as a three fletch and you throw that fourth one on, that might push you over the edge of gaining enough stability to get good broadhead flight. So if you're kind of on the edge of things and you're not quite getting good arrow flight, throwing that fourth vein on there or any, and even throwing uh, a bit of helical, that's that's the way the, the fletching kind of twists onto the arrow. It's offset, which makes the arrow spin. Um, all those together would... Uh, I think you could see some accuracy gain there, um, but it really comes down to you, you've got to test it. You got to you got to try it out for yourself to see if um, if there is any benefit. And speaking about helical uh, and, and you know fletching numbers of fletching size of fletching, all of that is based on the person's bow, the draw weight. The, there's so many variables, right, that play into it. It's not as if you could just give me an arrow and say, hey, shoot that. I know it's going to shoot great for you. There's always a bit of tweaking no matter what what you're doing, correct? True. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Same with, with rifles and reloading. You just can't. Sometimes you can buy factory ammo and have it work fantastic, but, you know, you can take a load that somebody's worked up for their rifle and say, Oh, here, these work awesome. Try them and yours. It doesn't work that way. So yeah, there's so many driving factors that determine, um, how I build my arrows and, and a lot of it is just trial and error. Even you can take a, a two very close bows and, and try two different arrow setups. And one might, even though the bows might be close to identical, one arrow might shoot better out of the other. They're just, they're all they're their own unique animal, and you got to kind of tailor each setup to each one. But as long as you stick to the fundamentals of, you know, having a fair amount of helical on there, enough fletching for the size of broadhead you're shooting. You know, if you're going with a small mechanical, you can get away with a smaller fletching. If you're running a a large, like um, two blade broadhead, you you'll need a lot of fletching on the back end to to correct that. So. Whatever you're doing on the front end, you need to have quite a bit more on the back end to, to make up for it. And as far as like the direction of helical, left or right, that's another thing that it's not the same for everybody. Um, there's there's a million other driving factors that determine that as well. What makes an arrow spin? As an example, you can cut all of your fletchings off an arrow or just shoot a bare shaft and you know, at a close distance on your target. And some arrows naturally spin to the right and some of them naturally spin to the left. There's so many theories out there of what 
what causes that that nobody really knows nobody has a good confirmed answer as what causes it but just some naturally spin right some spin left i don't i don't really care to figure out why i just go with whatever direction um they're naturally spinning and that's the direction i i uh, direct my helical so out of my setups with i shoot gold tip arrows and when i've shot eastern arrows they've always come out spinning left and so i always run a left helical do you shoot all of your shafts to figure out which way they spin and then and then adjust accordingly? No, cause out of a dozen, like, I can't say that I've ever taken a, a clean dozen bear shaft and checked every one of them. It was significant enough of a twist, natural twist as they're coming out of the bow, that they've all gone the same direction. Uh, mine is probably driven off of the direction that I twist my bow strings when I build them. Um that's that's you know if you were ask a bunch of other guys what causes it and that a lot of them would agree that it's the the twist of your string but there's been some cases out there where the twist of the string had nothing to do with it so all right let's jump to the next question game plan hunts says top single pin hunting sites so i i like black gold i've been shooting their hunting sites for about three or four years now i i love that they're bomb proof they're super durable, you know, for a, a mountain hunter, you know, like that's not my most important thing, but that's something that I really appreciate is having a well-built site. Uh, there are a lot of good brands out there, like pick one. I mean, they're all pretty good. Um, but what I like about the black gold is how easy they are to level. Um, their, their pro site is the one that I use. I don't use a single pin, but you, you can buy the exact same site that I use with a single pin assembly on it. I run a, a five pin slider. Um, but they're definitely worth looking at. Um, like I said, there are a lot of other good brands out there, but black gold is kind of where I found home and they're easy to work on and great company as well. All right. A question from Garrett Dalton differences and benefits of back tension versus index finger versus thumb releases. It's a great question. Uh, Garrett, um, so a hinge release or a, a back tension release, as they're often called, I, back tension is kind of a polluted term in my world. It, it means so many different things, but I, it's known as a hinge release. Uh, the benefits of a hinge release is I feel like when I'm shooting a hinge, I have more control. So um, I can just start my shot process and just forget about it and just focus my mind towards um, execution and aiming and, and lining everything up to where I'll, I'll score a 10. Um, it's like almost like lighting a fuse on a firecracker and you just wait for it to go off. That's, that's kind of the sensation I have when I'm shooting a, a hinge style release. Um, they're awesome for target. Like when I have a lot of pressure on me, like first scoring end or the last scoring end to win a match, uh, I feel more confident with a hinge in hand. So, so those are the, some of my, pros of shooting a hinge the cons would be they're difficult to shoot on a moving target they're difficult to shoot in the wind um and they're also yeah for hunting and shooting in the wind i'm not a big fan of them um in the wind when you're your sight now the a hinge release is fired by either rotating the entire the, the entire handle of the release is the trigger so by rotating that handle and whatever way you choose to rotate that handle is, is up to you. So the term back tension comes from um, some people were teaching that you fire the shot by squeezing your shoulder blades together to make it rotate, which I don't do. And I don't know any really top level pro archers that actually use back tension in that way. Um, they're more of working the release by hand, you know, pulling it to the edge. And then as they steady their aim, and maintain strength on the back end of the release of shot fires. So yeah, shooting it at game while they're moving and also shooting fast shots on animals. They're, they're just not that great for, um, switching to the differences. And I'll talk about the index finger release. So that's the type of release that straps around your wrist and you trigger it with your trigger finger. Um, that is my absolute go-to for hunting. Um, I feel like, I can make a quick shot with an index trigger release. 
if I'm on, on game and animals, I'm just way more confident shooting that type of release. I've got to make one good shot. Um, and I can make it happen. The, uh, the downfall of an index, um, release would be, it's easy to develop target panic. So I know a lot of guys, you know, I, I've had it before as, as well. And they, it, they do take a little bit more mind control. So I typically practice all year with a hinge or a back tension style release. And then I'll pull out the index finger, you know, a month before the hunt while I'm starting to side in broadheads. And that way I've kind of worked out any bad habits and I can shoot the index release really clean. Um, switching to pros and cons of a thumb release. Uh, really, oh, and one more disadvantage to an index release is you might not get as consistent of an anchor point. Um, I typically take my index finger knuckle and lodge it behind the back of my jawbone underneath my ear. That's where I anchor in. And with a, with a handheld release, you, you turn your hand where your knuckles are facing your jaw and it's a very solid anchor point. So you get the same feel as you get with a, with a hinge style release, that same positive bone to bone contact, but you're activating it with your thumb. Um, what I would recommend is, you know, if you're fighting some target panic, you know, you could try a back tension release or a hinge release. Um, and then so let's say you get really used to uh, a hinge style release. And then for hunting season, you want to um, switch over to something with, with a mechanical trigger that's easier to operate on a moving target or to make a quick shot with, you could switch to a thumb and bridging that gap would be a lot easier. Um, and again, uh, a downfall of a thumb release, if, if you don't quite have the mind control to, to squeeze through the shot, um, that, that is one downfall of them, I'd, I'd say. And for hunting, the reason I go with a wrist strap over a handheld is I've lost handhelds while I've been out hunting. <laughs> so I prefer to, while I'm hunting, I want that thing strapped to my wrist. As far as shooting 3D and competitive um, shoots, what release would you always be using in that environment? So up until last year, I would have told you uh, a hinge back tension style release for all competition. So with, w let me clarify I, of why I would say that up until like just a couple of years ago, as I've gotten into this, into competing with a rifle, you know, I, I've shot a lot of rounds with my, with my trigger finger and I bet I put four cases of 22 ammo through my rip through, through my 22 trainer. That's, um, 20,000 rounds. And for whatever reason, doing, 20,000 rounds through a 22 rim fire when the year I picked up my wrist strap to hunt with it, it was like, I, I was a new man. Like it was, <laughs> it <back>. was so <laughs> awesome. Like I figured out the trigger control part of it. Like I just gained so much confidence from shooting that rim fire so much that it was just second nature. And I, I got over whatever demons I had for my entire life by shooting 20,000 rounds of 22. So, um, Last year, I shot most of my 3D tournaments around home with an index because I, I felt in total control with it. I was confident, and they sh shoot awesome. Like, I always shoot better groups with, with an index than I do a, a hinge-style release. But in the past, I'd always felt more confident when I was nervous with a hinge release just because they're, you kind of take your mind off the firing mechanism um, while you're aiming with a hinge. So... I bounce back and forth quite a bit. I like to keep it fresh. So, While we're talking um, about the finger release, um, talk about where you think that that release, I guess the um, trigger, if you will, where that should be exactly positioned. And then talk about as you draw the bow back, because you see it, if you go down to any local range and you've seen them all, you see all sorts of, you know, how people bring their finger around and go through that whole process. Yeah. So just from a safety aspect, uh, is I'm drawing back with a, with an index finger. I use a Carter quickie that, and I use a custom made, uh, wrist strap, a guy out of Indiana, um, makes them out of like baseball mitt glove leather. Like they're, they're super awesome. Um, you mail the guy a check for 50 bucks and they'll send you like the nicest wrist strap you've ever seen. 
so that's that's my go-to for hunting and and uh target archery recently um so as i'm drawing back for safety reasons i'll put my finger behind the trigger and press against it backwards draw back i'm looking for my anchor point that's kind of what my conscious thought is as i'm as i'm climbing into my anchor and as i'm looking for that anchor i'll at the same time i'll, I'll start to rest my finger on the trigger I'll, I'll i'm not afraid of it like um i'll preload the trigger a little bit not enough to make it fire but i'll i'll get the tip of my finger i use a 90 degree trigger press same exact way i shoot a rifle um i put the the center of the trigger right on the the pad of my finger now i know a lot of guys like to hook them deep and put them into a less sensitive part of their knuckle or their finger i like to feel like i'm in control i like to be able to feel where i'm at in the shot i like i don't want it to come by like a total surprise but i i want to I like it on the pad of my finger just because it's more, more sensitive. And I make sure I use a 90 degree trigger press. That way I'm pulling straight back on the trigger. I see guys all the time that their releases are too long and they're, they're pushing their fingers are on their trigger coming uh, top side down. So they're, they're almost like pushing down on the trigger to get at the fire. I'm pulling straight back with my finger and I, and I don't, um, necessarily like trigger the shot by a rapid acceleration of my finger or punching it like i'm i'm building up probably half the tension of of the release like let's say it's a one pound trigger i'll pull the the first half pound by preloading it and the second half of that pull gets fired by aiming um so i'm i'm thinking about uh, maybe I'm getting in the weeds a little bit here, but no, I love just, it. Okay, so as I'm as I'm building up that tension on the release, um, my I'm lining. So once I found my anchor, I've preloaded it. My mind consciously switches from anchor point to sight picture. Now, I what I'm doing at that point, I'm just looking for a sight alignment or a sight picture that will score me a ten. Um, or aiming is what you could call it. Like, but I'm just kind of looking. I, I have it pre-determined in my mind of, of the sight picture I need to score a 10, and that's what I'm looking for. So I get the pin on the target as quick as I can. I usually settle in from the top and come in from the 6 o'clock side. So I, I'm, I, I come past the target with my sight pin. It's there at 6 o'clock. And as I, the reason I come up from the bottom is it adds a little bit of tension to the system. And as I'm pushing or not really pushing but like adding strength to my bow arm to steady the pin in the center of the target as i maintain that tension on the front end with my bow arm and keeping my finger preloaded on the trigger my shot breaks while i'm aiming Does that makes sense yeah so another way of thinking about it is i i do this in training but not necessarily while i'm shooting or hunting but while I'm learning the dynamics of this shot process that I use, and I, I'll tell you right now, this shot process may not work for everybody, but it, it's really helped me. I think about my sight pin as a drill bit. We've all drilled a hole in a, in a wall, right, with a screw gun or with a drill. And to get, you know, you mark the hole in the wall or you mark it with a pencil where you want the hole to go, and you've got to maintain steady tension on that drill as you're pushing it into the wall. And eventually, as you drill through the the, the the drill breaks through the other side and it, it lunges forward, right? Mm -hmm. So I think about my shot process in a simple way while I'm while I'm learning the process. So I just think about my my sight pin being a drill bit, and I got to bore a hole straight through the center of that target. So by preloading my trigger, half of the tension is pulled. I steady up my bow arm, come in from six o'clock side into the target. And as I'm pushing that pin into the target, I'm just thinking about it being a, a drill bit and I'm drilling the hole through the target. And as I'm steadying my bow arm, that adds enough tension that the shot breaks while I'm aiming dead center. While I'm boring a hole through that target, it breaks through the other side and my arrow lands right where, right where my pin was at. Beautiful. Love it. Great explanation. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, Danny Dot Ender, best way to learn to stack pins? Great question. So this is for the guys that are using like um, a five pin site, right? So 
um, you've got them sighted in for 20, 40, or excuse me, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And say he comes across an, a target at 80 yards, he's not just going to willy-nilly just guess and hold how far it goes over your back, over the back of the target. There's a method, it's called stacking pins. And he asked for the best way, so here's what I'm going to explain. So you need to go buy a pair of just cheap plastic veneer calipers like you know not a not a set of calipers with like uh the battery in them the digital readout or the dial or anything just the cheap plastic one i think they're on amazon for like a buck they're just a slide ruler with a pair of calipers so that's the first thing you need to do is is get a pair of those calipers the next step is there's a software program. A lot of people are familiar with it, and there's more than just Archer's Advantage, but Archer's Advantage is the one that I use. Um, you'll print out a sight scale or a sight tape is what they're often known as, and um, you'll go into the settings of where you print them out and assuming you've got the right speed and everything for your bow. So this sight scale is a representation of, of your gap on your pins, right? Um, and so what you'll do is you'll set up the, the the way it prints out, you'll want numbers on both sides. So you'll have 20 through 100 on one side and 20 through 100 on the other side. And and adjust the width of the sight scale so it's a little bit wider. And you're going to cut that out and you're going to tape it on to that sliding caliper right across the top of it. And where the gap is on the, the sliding caliper, you will take a razor blade and you're going to cut a slit down it. So what I'm what I'm looking for is basically a sight tape that's split right down the middle. And I apologize if this is going to go over somebody's head, but he indeed asked for the best way. So that's <laughs> how I'm explaining it. Uh, and so what, what you want that to be able to do is when you slide those calipers, those two sight tapes are going to adjust side by side. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're out on the field course and you've got an 82 yard target and you're only sighted in from 20 through 60. So you're going to slide your 60 yard pin down to 82 yards right mm -hmm. and then you'll look up on the so the right side of the scale let's just say that's how far your target is and the left side of the scale is what's going to determine your gap so you're going to slide the scale so your 60 is on your 80 right because mm -hmm. or did i say 80 or 82 yards 82 82 yards you're going to put it on 82 yards and then you're going to look up at 60 on the left scale and you're going to cross it over and see where it's lined up at. And let's say it's on 35 yards. So what you'll do is you'll draw back, you'll aim at the target, put your 60 yard pin right where you want to hit. And you're going to look up above the target where 35 yards is at. Right. And then you're going to take, you're going to, you're, you'll memorize right where that's at. You're going to pick a spot on the mound. Maybe there's like a little rock or something that you can aim at where your 35 yard pin is, or you're going to see how far it is off the back of the animal. And you're going to aim at the, you're going to put your 60 yard pin right where that 35 yard mark was. And then you'll execute your shot. That is how the most accurate way to gap pins. What's the worst way? We're just willy nilly guessing, <laughs> like just holding over. But, um, and you can still do that with uh, without the sliding scale. It's just not as accurate. So if, if you do it without the sliding scale, you'll have to maybe let down. Like you'll, you'll draw back and you'll look and you'll find a reference point of where your 60 was at. Or your 60 and you're going to count up two pins. Uh, it's just not as accurate. So by using that sliding scale, it matches the exact um, graduation of your, of your sight settings and it's 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 the way forward if, if you're gapping pins that is the way you do it great stuff uh next question mike at rolling bones speed versus kinetic energy where do you fall what balance question mark that's a that's another good, really good question um thanks mike so me personally i've always been and I've, and I've validated it. I, I don't do it this way just because I've always done it, but I've validated it year after year. I, I try to shoot the heaviest arrow I can and still get around 275 to 295 feet per second. Because what's important, the most important thing for me when bow hunting 
and it, and I feel like everybody should be on the same page is shot placement. Shot placement is the absolute most important thing when hunting an animal. Like when you decide to shoot one, you've got to place that arrow in the right spot. And so I have found that having that speed is like a happy medium. You know, the bow still shoots really forgiving. I've shot setups that are over 300 feet a second and they just get finicky and they're harder to control. And the, on the, on the other side of that, if you're shooting too slow, if, if you misjudge that animal by a yard and a half or it takes a few steps or you don't have time to range it, like there's not as much forgiveness there. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I fall on the whole, what balance do you want? I, my, my most important factor is, is, is shot placement. And I feel like I get the most accuracy out of my setups shooting right around 290 feet a second. And I know there's a little bit of give and take there. Now, um, while I worked at Gold Tip, I was a sales rep there for those guys. And um, we used to get this question quite a bit. And at the time, I was working with a guy. He uh, was going to BYU for engineering. And, and his professor got on the, a kick about momentum and kinetic energy. And, and so we asked him, like, okay, ask your professor. We want to know, like, what's better to have momentum or, or kinetic energy? Where does it all fly? Where does it all lie? And so he created a chart. I wish I still had it, but he took kind of where momentum peaks out and where uh, kinetic energy cross. And from a 250 grain arrow all the way to a 750 grain arrow, you could almost draw a straight line through them. They were both equally optimized, I guess. So kind of best of both worlds around that 280 foot per second mark. So whether you're shooting a 250 grain arrow you're a beginner and you're a kid and you're, you're trying to get some speed or you're shooting a really heavy setup. I feel like the, the, the right balance there is around that 280 foot per second mark. So, I mean, you're talking not just for you, you're saying scientific data and data that you've seen and, and, you know, just all your years of doing it, that 275 to 290, but the sweet spots right there at that 280. Like for everyone, if everyone would get shoot that 280, they would probably end up shooting way better is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, totally. And I will argue that with anybody. And I, I know the big kick right now is extreme FOC, and guys are loading up the front of their arrows with crazy amounts of weight. They're shooting six, 700 grain arrows um, out of a compound bow. Yeah, now I get for a recurve, that's probably something you would want to do because you're shooting, you know, typically traditional setup, you're going to be closer distances. But for hunting out here in the West, like I, I get some, I love it when I get a close shot, but a lot of times I'm stretching them out, you know, past 50. Um, and I, I, I don't, if you were to, if, if I would challenge anybody that if they want to know what would be better for them, go shoot a round of 20 targets. 3d unmarked shoot half of them with your rangefinder and the other half without for score and and do that with a with your heavy arrow tip setup shooting 240 feet per second or whatever you got going on and then build something up that's shooting another batch of arrows that's that's shooting you know the 280 290 range go out and shoot it for score you may have to switch it up a little bit and then the course just so you're not like relying on the numbers from the first time you shot it and maybe try it with a, a really fast setup, shooting, you know, 320, 330, if you're capable of that. Go go shoot a couple of rounds and see which one you score the best with. Because what you do on an unmarked 3D target is, is very likely what you're going to do on an animal. Um, I've tested it when, you know, I'm shooting, like I've misset my sight by, you know, step back at 60, 70 yards and misset your sight on purpose by like three yards and shoot a real heavy arrow a slower speed and see where it impacts and then do the same thing with a fast setup. And you're, you're going to like where the fast arrow landed because it's quicker. It's got a flatter tra tra trajectory. And if, if our number one driving factor for, for hunting animals is, is shot placement, um, it, wh why not I shoot the most accurate flattest shooting setup you can without sacrificing, you know, any shootability or forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, it makes, total sense. Uh, Kevin, I want to take a second here and thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com. My friend Cody Nelson of 20 plus years is the optics manager there. 
And if you guys want to buy any binoculars, any optics, anything to do with glassing, give Cody a call. You can reach him at 702-847-8747. You can also, uh, that's extension two, you can also text him on his cell phone. That's 602-399-3699. Also want to remind you guys, it's application season. Uh, GoHunt.com Insider is the best Western hunting resource tool out there. If you go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott, by signing up, you're going to get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card just for signing up. So make sure to go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott. I want to thank Kuyu. Obviously, Kevin, you work with Kuyu and work for Kuyu. Uh, Kuyu.com, that's K U I U.com. Uh, that is the ultralight hunting gear that I've been wearing uh, since late 2010. That's what I wear on all of my hunts. Make sure to go to kuyu.com. It's a direct-to-consumer. You can't get it at any retail uh, shop. You order it right online. Uh, go to kuyu.com. Uh, also, phonescope.com. Use the jscott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. On xmaps.com, use the jscott20 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount there at OnX. And then Apex Ammunition. Go to apexmunition.com. That's the home of the TSS, the Tungsten Super Shot. And I appreciate all of the sponsors of this podcast. Kevin, uh, let's get right back into the questions here. You're doing yeah, you a great bet. job. Appreciate it. Uh, how to overcome. You're getting all the good ones here. Uh, how to <laughs> overcome target panic. Well, those ones can be a doozy because there, there's so many types of different ways of, of freezing up or, or having target panic. Um, well, let me let me back up for a second. Yeah. Where do you think it mostly generates from? I think fear. Of what? Either fear of success or fear of missing. Um, for me, anyway, like... I, you know, pressure gets on you and that's when things get real. Like whether it's the, in a match or on an animal, like buck fever, like it, it's just, you want it so bad, but then you overthink it and you, your, your mind loses track. Um, but I have, I have, I definitely get target panic from time to time. Like it comes and goes, like it's a lot of work. Uh, I, you know, when I go out to Kuyu, uh, on my every six week, you know, visit to the office. I take my bow with me and just uh, west of Kuyu, there's an awesome archery range. It's a Yolo Bowman. Um, they've got two 14 foot target filled courses and they set up around a 3d. So all the guys from the office will, you know, after we're done working for the day, we'll, we'll, we'll grab all our gear and we'll head down to the range. And, um, we was working with a, a bunch of the guys there at the office and they were asking me, you know, same thing. How do I overcome target panic? And, I usually start by asking some questions to figure out kind of what they're dealing with, whether they can aim really steady and they just can't get their finger on the trigger to make it execute, or they can put their finger on the trigger, then they can't aim or, and it's usually driven by an unsteady sight picture. Like they just can't quite get things steady enough and it just causes them to panic. Um, so circling back and when I, the way I was explaining the way I fire my release the, the way I, I, pre I, I preload the trigger and I think of my pin as a, as a drill bit into the target um, where I've got to bore a hole through the target. For me, that really like simplifies the process. And, and as I'm practicing my shot routine or, or kind of the way I execute the shot, I like to do it on a, um, a the term blank bailing gets thrown out a lot. It's the same as like dry fire practice with, with a rifle or hitting the batting cages if you're playing baseball, or you know, just working on your swing if you play golf. It's it's kind of the equivalent of that. It's just blank bailing. You'll get up kind of close to a target. Um, that's where I learn my shot. That's where I practice my swing. Um, and I know a lot of guys preach that you should take your sight off the bow. You know, if you're if you're really new to the the sport and you're just trying to learn one thing at a time. Um, I think that's where a lot of guys get into trouble is they buy a bow then they try to get it sighted in right off the bat. And then all these bad habits kind of come into play and they've skipped all these other, um, building blocks of, of a shot process. 
So they skipped learning stance. They skipped learning hand placement. They skipped learning how to pull the trigger on a release. And they've just jumped right into um, trying to hit a target and get their bow sighted in so they can go shoot with their buddies. Now, some people can just do that. And other people, I, for one, I'm not, I was never that talented. I wasn't talented enough to be able to just go do that. It took a lot of work. Um, I learned the wrong way. I learned the wrong way of just getting out there and trying to sight in a bow and shoot it. I never, I never laid a solid foundation of a, of a good shot. Um, so if you're dealing with target panic, I would, I would really recommend starting fresh, get up close to a target. You know, the, the times we're in right now, a lot of, a lot of the ranges are closed. A lot of the 3d shoots are not happening. Um, use this time wisely, get, start from scratch, you know, get, get close to the target and, and remove completely remove the, the scoring or where you're hitting out of the equation. Just work on your swing, work on, you know, get your stance dialed in where your, your, your feet are shoulder width apart. And, and it, you know, there's so many, so much information out there and, and top level professional archers, you can follow and watch their videos. Like there's so much info out there. There's no excuse. Um, but I, w- I would start with the basics and just get, just check one thing off and what, go through a checklist and just check everything off to where you feel like you've perfected it, perfect your stance, perfect your grip, perfect your release. Work, that method that I explained of, of firing the, the way you fire your release is usually where people get hung up because when they're trying to aim, their mind's going back and forth between aiming and squeezing, aiming and squeezing. And that's something people don't experience when they're shooting a gun, like off a bench or off a bipod. The, it's it's rock steady. They don't have to really worry about it. So all they really have to focus on is squeezing the trigger. But bows do not aim nearly as well as a rifle off a bench um, or off a bipod. So you, you kind of get used to seeing a little bit of movement um, in your sight picture. And that's okay. Like when when I'm aiming at a target, I'm not like, Sometimes I'm dead steady, but most of the time my pen is just kind of doing a figure eight around the target. Like it's, it's got some movement to it. And as you get nervous, that, that, that movement magnifies. Now I've, I've stood on the line and shot for world championships before. Like I wasn't super dead steady when I was breaking those shots, but the nerves never really go away. You just kind of learn to shoot through them. And if you ask any pro archer, they'll tell you the same thing. They're like, Oh no, I was nervous as could be, but they may look like they're rock steady on the outside. It's just, they've learned to commit to the shot. You got to be so determined of what type of shot you're going to make before it happens. Um, So kind of circling back, you know, once you get all the mechanics down, like you can stand there with proper form, execute the release smoothly, cleanly, everything's kind of dialed in the next step of that would be to build a shot process and, and follow that process all the time. Um, I was watching a a little video the other day. It was a, it was a a leopard had caught a, he'd taken down an antelope and it was going to drag it up this tree. So here's this video of this leopard at the base of a tree with an, with an antelope laying there dead on the ground. And the first thing that leopard did is it looked up in the tree it stood there on its haunches and it's looking, it's like breathing really heavily and like trying to catch its breath. And I don't know who videoed this. Maybe you guys have seen it, but this leopard stand there is looking up in the tree. He was visualizing what he was about to do. He had to drag that freaking antelope up that tree, get it to where he could eat it, where it was safe from other predators. And the first thing he did is he stopped and he looked and he visualized about what he was going to do. And I'm like, and I picked up on that and I'm like, he just visualized what he was about to do. And he's standing there and he grabs a hold of it and he, he jumps up the tree and he like, he drags it up there and he, and he doesn't. So, and it just made me think about like, man, that's the same way I shoot. That's the way I, that's the same way. I, I got something really important that I've got to do. I want to shoot this deer. There's a giant buck. I got him bedded down. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize what I want to happen. I'm going to make a plan. Um, and so when I'm visualizing, I typically, in my mind, I picture what my sight is going to look like on that target, like what my sight picture needs to look like. This is be, before you've even drawn your bow. Yeah, before I even draw my bow. And this only takes like a split second. This is going to be a lot of words of explaining what I'm doing, but this is like, it's a thought. That's right. all that it is. It's just one thought. Um, 
I visualize my pin on the target, what it's going to feel like, you know, picture my, my arrow just zapping right through the middle of him. I've painted that picture in my mind of what I want to happen. Now, compare that to somebody else that, that doesn't have the confidence or they don't really know or they haven't practiced it enough. What you visualize is probably what your outcome will be. If, you, if you're thinking about missing or you, you paint a picture of like flinching or just that get, whatever, that, that's probably what's going to happen. So paint the picture in your mind of what you want to happen. Visualize it. Make a plan. Um, be like that leopard that, that looked up that tree and was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. It's going to be tough, but I, I'm going to get through this. I know exactly what I got to do. I'm going to get up there. Um, so once my conscious mind has has made a plan of what I'm going to do. I'm like ultra determined. Like this is what I'm going to do. Like I am, I'm putting that arrow right into that deer's heart. Like that is, that is my determined focus. That is the outcome I'm looking for. And then I take two conscious slow breaths. Like I, I think about my breathing and what that does is it kind of slows my heart rate down. Cause you'll get a little amped up. You'll feel some adrenaline as you're visualizing this. You don't, you just replayed it in your mind, what you want to happen you should be feeling a little bit of nerves. So I'm going to take two conscious breaths. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to slow my heart rate down. That's going to refill with oxygen. Like it's going to make me a little bit stronger. My eyes are probably starting to dilate a little bit. Um, and then as soon as I've taken my two breaths, my mind focuses on finding my anchor point. Um, I have a very specific anchor. It's not difficult to find, but I have a certain way that I anchor in and it just, a, I'm just looking for that proper feel of the way, the tension is, um, I've got the weight of the bow loaded into my back. I'm bone to bone. My nose is touching my string. I'm looking through my peep sight. There's like a particular feeling that I'm looking for of when I'm in the right spot. So that's my second conscious thought. Once I've found that spot and everything feels right and I'm loaded up and I'm pulling into the, the, the stops on the cams and I'm, and I'm anchored in and I'm feeling strong, my, ne- my next conscious thought is sight picture. And I, and I say the word aim kind of loosely. Like I'm just thinking about aiming. Like I'm not like trying to hold everything super steady. I'm focused on getting my pin on the target quickly. I I don't want to waste energy. I don't want to diddle dally around. I'm going to get my pin on the center of the target as quick as I can. And, and that's when I just, I just maintain that sight picture and the whole pushing the drill bit into the target thing. That's all kind of subconscious at that point. I've already built that into my program. Like that's already there. I don't have to think about doing any of that. I don't think about my breathing, but I'm, and I keep saying I'm, I'm using these conscious thoughts to keep my brain occupied. So the rest of my body can kind of do its thing. And if you've ever read any of Lanny Basham's work, that's exactly where I'm not like Kevin Wilkie making this up. This is, this is who I've learned it from. I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, so as I'm, you know, studying that sight picture, looking for the sight picture I want, the shot breaks, and then I go into evaluate what happened. Like, do I need to adjust my sight? Uh, was my timing too slow? What can I do on this next shot? Cause the only shot you really have control over is the next one. So I'll learn from that one and I'll, and then I'll continue the process. If I'm hunting, I'm, you know, hopefully looking for a blood trail if it, if it was the target, I'm moving on to the next one to, to start my shot process with a quick visualization and my two breaths and start it all over again. So back to the, the question about how to overcome target panic. You got to learn all the dynamics of the physical aspects of shooting a shot, a well-placed shot, and then you got to build in a shot uh, process. So that is how I overcome target panic. And sometimes switching your equipment, like a different style of release, will give you kind of a, a nice reset to where you can build a clean foundation. Um, but that was a lot of information for something that takes like <laughs> half a second, just a couple of seconds to, <laughs> to, to execute. Do you, do you, uh, I know I've gone back and forth and I've had target panic and been through all the different stages and all of that, but one of the things that worked for me, and I, I'm just curious to get your take on it, is I found that if I just shoot one arrow and go get it, shoot one arrow and go get it, instead of just sitting there and just shooting and shooting and shooting, it that really helped me. I don't know where I found that or who told me, but they, you know, just shoot one arrow, go.
go get it from I, the target. What's your thoughts on that? That really helped me. Is that is there anything to that, or is that just something that helped me? Yeah, I think you know if, if you're laying it on the line, you've got one shot. You're not thinking about the five others you can make right after to clean things up. You're you're putting all your focus on that one shot, which is what we do when we hunt. Um, and and I I, I want to say I remember reading something very similar from Randy Ulmer that he would go out and he would shoot just one arrow just to make sure, like because that's how it's going to be when you're hunting. You're you you got to make one clean shot, and I think when you do that, you commit yourself. You get determined to make one shot, so you're going to do everything right. It's not like you're giving yourself, um, you know, five or six tries to get it right. Then you're not fully committed. So, is that, you know, coming from me? It's working for you. Is that? Does that sound like I'm? Yeah. No. I mean, I'm in the ballpark there. Yeah. I just I know that that's something that helped me. Is just, you know, that that really helped me. So I just was going to throw that out there. Yeah. So, you know, I circling back to, you know, the guys I was shooting with out of the office, we kind of went through that whole process and it was cool. Every time I'd go out and shoot with those guys, um, you know, like all ships rise together. Every, every time we would meet up, we were, we were making each other better. So if you can get, you know, some guys that, that can hold you accountable, accountability is a big thing. Like when you're trying to overcome something and if you got some guys that will watch your shot and, 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 and kind of help each other out. That's awesome. If you got a good group of guys you can shoot with that know what they're doing, um, you know, have don't don't be afraid to to ask for help from somebody that knows what they're doing. And and man, it just takes a lot of just buckle down hard work to get through it. Anytime I've gotten through it, there's no easy fix. It's just to get after it and figure it out. Make up your mind of what you want to happen. Convince yourself that is the only way to shoot the bow and just get ultra determined and just tackle it. Like you got to just be a little bit of aggressive to get over target panic. Good stuff. Next question, uh, come from Camden J Hess 11 single or multi pin for hunting elk. Good question. Uh, Camden. Um, so the benefits of a single pin is you get to dial it to the exact distance that you're shooting. So if it's, 53 and a half yards you can put your sight on 53 and a half yards and you can hold pin dead on execute your shot and it's you don't have the clutter of multiple pins in your in your housing um so that that's one of the benefits of it uh the negative aspect of a single pin is i like to know where the top arc of my arrow is so let's say i've dialed or I've got a 60 yard shot and I'm going to throw my 60 yard pin on there. I can look, and this is why I always run a 20 yard pin as well. I know a lot of guys start their pins out at 35 or 40 or something. They feel like their bows are fast enough that they can just have one top pin. I like mine at 20 because that shows me the top arc of my arrow. So let's say you've got a, a, an elk standing there at 60 yards and you draw back on him and there's some branches at 30 kind of halfway between and your 30 yard pins parked on that branch, guess what you're going to hit? You're going to, you're going to drain a branch. You're going to mm-hmm. cut your tag on a, on a patch of oak brush or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I like having a stack of pins with, when you're running a single pin, you lose that ability. Now I'm, I'm sure as I get older, or eyesight gets worse. You know, I may have to just switch to a one pin just because sometimes your, your vision might not be good enough to just dis- to differentiate all the different pins. So you got to do what's best for you. For me, I, I like a multi-pin setup for hunting. Like, um, one year I was hunting, I was on the Wasatch Front here in Utah. At, at the time, I was working for Hoyt Archery, and I was going up and I was working, or I would um, go up and bow hunt in the morning, and then I, I could usually be to work by, like, 10 or 11. Um, so I was up hunting in the morning, and I... Uh, I got on a couple of these bucks and they were sparring. It was late season and they stepped out at like 80 yards and it was, and I can, I felt like I could make that shot. So I reached down and I, I rovered my sight. I was shooting a five pin slider. So I rovered it down to 80 yards and I took one last look through my range finder to give him a click to make sure I was on. And all of a sudden that buck started walking right at me. I couldn't move because he, he was like looking right at me. If I dropped my hand down, he was going to peg me. Um, 
And so I'm ranging him the whole time. And finally, as soon as his head wasn't to where he could see me move, I clicked him one last time at 57 yards. I reached down to move my sight back to normal, and I got all a little flustered. And to say the least, I, I couldn't get a shot on him. If I would have had a stack of pins, 20 through 80, I could have killed that buck <laughs> like a couple of times. But since I was fumbling around with that sight, so that is – another downfall of a single pin um i guess it really depends on your situation but um where i land today is a is a i'm willing to make the risk of of, ha of having to move my sight and and get caught with it out of adjustment um i, I like the five pin slider uh, i sighted in 20 through 60 so my five pins and most people when they run their sight scale or their sight tape, they start their sight tape out at 60. So they only use their Rover for shot 60 and further. But I don't know about you guys. I had some really tough 47 yard shots off a really steep ledge or something. And I liked being able to put pin on. So I run my sight, my bottom pin, my 60 can Rover all the way up to 20 and it'll go all the way down to, I think I get 120 before I, um, before I start getting into a clearance issue where my arrow is going to be brushing underneath my scope. Um, so that does a couple things for me. I, I can validate a better sight tape or better sight scale, you know, where I can check my bottom pin on 20 and then check it on 60 is far more accurate than a guy validating his 60 on 60 and then checking it again on 80 or maybe 100. So I get far more accurate sight scales I can rover my bottom pin up to 20. I can rover it all the way down to 120. It's my everything pin. So if I'm touching that knob on the side, I'm using the bottom pin. If I've got it locked on 60 yards, I can use the rack of pins. I got 20 through 60, and, I, and I'll use that as I'm hiking through. Um, but I typically do, will not dial unless um, I'm in a situation that I can do it. If I've got time to range it, the target I've, I've probably got time to reach down and dial my sight and make a good shot it gives you a lot more versatility going though with the rack of pins and being able to slide it doesn't it for sure yeah you i i feel like i can jump into any any shot situation and make it work next question here from t lowry seven most reliable mechanical broadhead for deer well, I'll take a pick, man. There's so many good broadheads out there. If there's if there's a time to be alive right now for, for broadhead choice and selection is right now. Um, that said, uh, for deer, I like a, a big mechanical, like, you know, one and a half to two inch cut diameter. Um, I like mechanicals because they're accurate. Uh, the, the, where I found home is with the Grim Reaper broadheads. They're local to me here in Utah fantastic guys and they make a they make a super good broadhead like they're really well built they're very accurate um i know a lot of people swear by a rear deploy blade um and they they think that you don't get quite the entry hole with an over-the-top um folding back type blade but i've shot sheets of paper at like position a sheet of paper in front of my target at like 100 and 100 yards and they open on a sheet of paper I've, I've pinned up bananas on my target just to shoot them something really soft and they'll open up on a banana. Um, so if I, if I had to pick one mechanical to last me the rest of my life, I would go with the, the Grim Reaper, um, mini mag four blade. Now, even though it's a four blade, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to shoot a three blade or a four fletched arrow. You can shoot three fletch on a four blade. It, it doesn't matter. Um, do you ever but, see a correlation where, you know, um, that matters at all? Never. Cause I mean, you, you think about you know, the broadheads on the front cutting the wind, the airfoil comes right back around the back of the broadhead and it's against the shaft. It's not like you've sliced through that wind and there's like a gap in space that your vein is going to somehow find. Like it just doesn't work that way. Like, um, by the time your fletchings, I mean, there's some turbulence going along the whole arrow, but like having your veins lined up with your body, it, 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 it's been proven time and time again. It does not matter. Kevin, this has been an awesome episode here, having you answer these questions. I really appreciate having you on the podcast. I know the listeners are just going to love this. And 
you know, this is just a, another reason why Kuyu has a great guy uh, in you doing this. You obviously your knowledge and uh, expertise and experience level with archery is amazing. Uh, Brendan Burns uh, told me how good you were, and it, it just pours out of you here. I really appreciate you spending time uh, with us. We're going to try and do a couple more installations of this, and I know the listeners uh, over the next handful of months are really going to get to enjoy this. So uh, I want to awesome. thank you for coming on. I want to thank uh, you for the work that you do with Kuyu. And, um, yeah, I look forward to the very next episode that we can do. And, and uh, to the listeners out there, uh, we've got a great resource here in Kevin and uh, look forward to getting more questions from you guys and uh, getting your questions answered. So, Kevin, until then, until next time, God bless. Okay, buddy? Thank you. Appreciate it.